<laughs> All right. Well, I would like to thank everyone for jumping on and a big thank you to Dr. Kim and Dr. Alviar for participating in our, what is it? Third Q and A. So we really appreciate your time. We know how valuable it is. And, um, Dr. Alviar is going to do his presentation first, and then we will move towards the Q&A. So. Okay, can everybody hear me? They're all muted. <laughs> They're all you should be good. Yes. So I can speak? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, our topic today is uh, superior mesenteric artery compression syndrome. I, the name is proper because of what we're talking about. And we will talk about the indications for surgery and then what approach. So let's see. I guess I have to use this. Uh, this syndrome has been known for quite some time. And uh, you can see that it was first discovered in 1754 by Boner when it described a group of young females with uh, syndrome with the pain and then vomiting. But it was until 1861 by Rokitansky, who did autopsy in some of the patients with syndrome, showing the compression of the duodenum by aorta and SMA. But it didn't gain too much interest until Laffer in 1908 reported um, 217 cases. So here's the real story. Uh, when Wilkie um, discovered it and described it, and it became Wilkes syndrome at that time. But there was still a lot of skepticism until they discovered uh, two diagnostic studies: the hypotonic duodenography, which is when you had upper GI, and then they slow down the duodenum and look at it. And then, of course, angiography was being developed. And then, finally, in the 80s, we had the CT scan. But it was not until 2001 when 3D CT and geography uh, became the definitive diagnosis, which we'll describe later. So what causes SMA? Uh, nobody really knows for sure what causes it. But I believe myself, uh, after having seen some patients and, and operating on them that there is some congenital predisposition to this. I've seen uh, two sets of siblings with the, with the syndrome that would require surgery, and they're both, there are four of them are doing well. It's a male and female kind of sibling. And then um, you've also seen uh, maybe a problem with the ligand of trites, which is a suspensary ligament of the duodenum and the junction between duodenum and jejunum. I'll describe that later as well as um, the low insertion of the SMA. I also noted that in teenagers, if there's a linear growth spurt without increase of their abdominal girth, that this is a causes problem. So the most common thing that we see that have been described by many is the excessive weight loss causing a variety of uh, from the different uh, causes of syndrome and uh, but uh, this needs further study. Uh, we've known the so-called cast syndrome in the past when there's a uh, people with spinal injuries. Of course, they were immo immobilized, so and they lost weight at the same time. But we also know that when you when you correct the, a uh, scoliosis and you straighten out the spine, you then shorten the angle between the SMA and the abdominal aorta. So. So that has, that's well known. Uh, there have been papers which showed uh, prenatal diagnosis and actually some patients that reported in infants and had been operated upon in different countries and um, including Israel, Japan, Saudi Arabia and China. And of course, uh, I've, I've noted this myself. I'm a pediatric surgeon, so I've seen it. Here's the ligament of trites. What is, what is it? It's a, it's a sus suspensory ligament uh, from the diaphragm that seems to suspend the uh, 
the last part of the duodenum, and then at the junction between the duodenum and the dejun dejunal junction. If it's short or thick, um, then it can cause some problems. Of course, you have all seen uh, people with uh, elongated mesenteries causing a fendulum effect because then the intestines become heavy and goes to the pelvis and perhaps uh, can cause a compression, but this is not well established. Other factors, of course, um, is patients with asthenic built, with are the thin patients with a short uh, junk, uh, distance between the, the, uh, the upper chest and to the spine. And this is quite common, 80% of the time. The most commonly described problem is the loss of the mesenteric or retroferral fat. This is why they insist on giving you nutrition so that you can perhaps increase uh, the fat and then it will, will uh, incre improve the problem with angulation. This needs further study. There have been a lot of studies about the visceral fat, fat and how it relates to SMA how it correlates with the BMI. And it's never been really uh, a good, they're not good studies that really prove it for sure. It's not conclusive. So I can't, I can't put my finger on this for sure. So um, what do we know? Uh, the incidence uh, has not changed. So nobody has, nobody has challenged uh, the what's be, what's seen in the literature it's always says it's very rare, extremely rare, 0.13 to 0.3 percent. But but nobody has really uh, compiled all the studies that might sh might show that maybe it's more common than most people realize. What's what's well known is that it's uh, commonly seen between 10 to 39 years of age. However, there are now reports in infants, and also I've seen reports in older patients, including a 75-year-old with actual SMA, not, not because of a vascular problem, but because of the actual syndrome with the SMA angulation and uh, distance. And of course, we've known that the asthenic built patients, uh, it's, it's found to be more common. And uh, what happens is that you have this severe epigastric pain with nausea after a meal. Vomiting is not always the case. It's all, it comes later. And then of course you have, you, you have early satiety, meaning after you eat a little bit and because your stomach's still full, uh, then you don't want to eat anymore. And then when you have the pain, then you, then you have weight loss, then it aggravates the condition. So, um, and of course, when your stomach uh, is full all the time and it, it becomes weak, so you get paralysis and, and it can become enlarged. I've seen stomach uh, so big all the way down to the pelvis. Constipation is because there's a delayed gastric emptying because when you don't uh, empty your stomach, you'll have what is known as the absence of the gastrocolic reflex, uh, which is the ability of the colon to, to, to move after your stomach is empty, but that's why you feel like you have to go to the bathroom after you eat. And, and if you eat something fatty or something, then you get diarrhea. And then uh, because of all this, you could have, uh, and then people with opioid dependency can also have constipation and hypomotility. And then uh, of course, biliary dyskinesia, I've seen that associated with the syndrome, but not all of them. Uh, the cause of the pain must be investigated. It's not been investigated. Uh, so all these questions that I pose here need to be investigated. Is it because of positive compression of the SMA against the duodenum? Is it because of the duodenum above the, the obstruction become distended because when a small bowel is distended from obstruction, that's when you have pain. Is it because there is a 
abnormal peristalsis with the to and fro motion? Is it because the stomach is trying to contract and trying not, and it, because it's not able to empty? Or is there a transient ischemia? Because ischemia is when there's a lack of blood supply to the muscles and to the nerves in the, in the bowel. So all this needs to be investigated. And, and we must have a conclusion to what causes the pain. And maybe because when you do a block, I see that block, the pain is relieved. And, and when you a block, uh, you, you make the blood vessels, the little blood vessels, maybe uh, create more blood flow to the area. So I think transient ischemia has to be investigated. What are unique physical findings? I've seen uh, patients with uh, the brewery or the trills. You can actually, I always call it, it, do you have a second heart there? Because you can see the pulsations when your patient is laying down, you can actually see pulsations in the belly. And you, when you put your finger in there, you can feel a trill. A trill is, is, is uh, like a thud into your finger. And a brew is when you listen to the stethoscope and you can hear a squash, like you have a murmur in there. But this is also noted with patients with uh, median arcuate ligament syndrome. Now, the Sokotian splash is because their stomach's always full with fluid and a little bit of air. And so when you move around, you could hear splashing. It's like, it's like uh, you have a bottle or, or the old days when you, when, if you're a cowboy, you can put water in the in your water content and you could feel the splash. And that's why they call it execution splash. Uh, syndromes associated with this, you can see there's many uh, uh, and uh, it's increasing. The one I uh, is May Turner syndrome. It's rare, but I think for for our discussion, you uh, have to remember two things: the Nightcracker syndrome, which I'll describe later, and the Median Arcuate Ligament syndrome, which I'll also describe later. I've seen seven patients that had SMA with the Median Arcuate Ligament syndrome and done both 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 procedures were done at the same time. In that tracker syndrome, we had one case and, and the, the procedure I did also corrected the night cracking syndrome. So this is something to, to do with. Ellis Danlos syndrome, very complicated. And it's, I don't think you can solve that problem readily. Here's a nut cracker syndrome. What happens is that the, uh, the renal vein here, the left renal vein can be compressed by the SMA at the same time, but not all patients have this. It's uh, it's only seen in some, but not not, all, not often. So what happens when there's food fear? The patient become malnourished because you have uh, prolonged and when it becomes prolonged and untreated, you'll have the devastating consequences. The patient lose weight and lose energy, uh, get mental problems and. So you wonder which came first, the psychogenic problem that may pull away, you're crazy, or is it because you're crazy because you just don't know whether you're gonna get better? So this has to be correlated. Uh, what, uh, what came first? It's like the egg and the chicken. Uh, which came first, the psychogenic problem, or is it because you had the SMA and then you, you, then you have a psychogenic problem, or, or they're both come at the same time. I have no idea. That needs to be addressed. So here are the studies. And uh, again, the gold standard is using the 3D CT. But if you uh, are allergic to the dye, then of course, MRI becomes important. And uh, you must have a gastric ending study because a lot of patients would have uh, some delayed gastric ending. You need to have a HIDA scan to rule out the gallbladder dis dysfunction. Uh, upper GI series is optional, but it can be done if done properly. And Doppler ultrasound, if you wanna, you can also do, uh, do a MALS median arcuate ligament syndrome with the 3D CT or with Doppler ultrasound. You can you can make that diagnosis. Here's a 
classic sample of an upper GI series showing the the dilated uh, duodenum. And then, of course, if you look, you must do this properly and patiently because most uh, radiologists, they just do it routinely. Like everybody has the same routine. They make you drink the, the, the contrast and then you stand up and then they, they rush you and then they don't do positional. They don't let you supine or prone or whatever. And what happens then is that this study is useless when the, when they don't do it properly. So you must tell, uh, the radiologist what you're looking for and they will, and you can see it better if you, and, and the thing is, you don't always see this. You, you gotta see it when the patient has symptoms. You don't, you don't do the study when there's no symptom. It's like a car with a rattle and then you go to your uh, car dealership and they don't hear the rattle and then you get out of the shop and, and the rattles, you hear the rattle again, a block, a block from where the shop is. And the same thing with this MA. You don't have, you, you can't always do this uh, study. You gotta do the study when there are symptoms. Here's a classic case of delayed, delayed study. The, see, they don't even delay study. They don't even do the study after they do, done the barium. They send you home 45 minutes later. They don't do, see if the, if the stomach still there, uh, the contrast still in the stomach or in your duodenum. This is done four hours later. We did 3D CT. Again, they have to be careful because they have to do the distance the angle and the distance. And now uh, the radiologists have said that uh, if the normal angle should be 25 to 60 degrees, and if the angle is 7 to 22, it's abnormal. If the distance between the uh, aorta and the SMA is two to eight millimeter, it's abnormal. But you must correlate all your findings with what the patient is saying, the clinical symptoms and the clinical uh, findings on examination. You know, you can't just rely on the x-ray. You, you can't rely, you gotta have the patient telling you, this is what's happening with me. And, and how to respond to the treatment that you're giving to the patient. Here's a classic 3D CT. And here you can see the stomach uh, very dilated. And there's a, there's a narrowing between the SMA and the aorta and uh, in both the lateral view and the AP, AP view and the sagittal view. Here's an angle, which is 30.3 degree angle. And I told you the norm, norm abnormal is 7 to 22. Here shows a massive uh, stomach, gastromegaly for somebody who had it for a while, quite a while. Here's a MRI, which showed a really good picture of the SMA compression and they showed the blockage with a abrupt uh, stoppage of the contrast. So what do we do? Well, first of all, you gotta, you gotta determine whether this is acquired or some, somehow a congenital con congenital. But you can always try conservative regardless of what the, what the etiology is. You can try frequent small feedings uh, with postural therapy, which means that uh, when you feel full, you just lay down on your, some people feel better on the right side down. Some people feel better on the left side down. I recommend some people mostly on the right side down because that's where your stomach empties on the right. And you can do prone. Uh, position, but you got to be like a puppy dog. You know, both both limbs have to be up. Uh, both the up, uh, the elbow and the and the knees should be up, and this will allow the uh, SMA to to be towards the abdomen, uh, towards the uh, abdominal wall, and uh, would relieve the obstruction. And if you do this, and you gain weight from that, from frequent small feedings. And, and don't drink too much at the time of feeding, just drink in between small amount of food. And, and, and of course you have to choose your food, whatever you, you think is not, it's not too saucy or not too heavy, uh, not too rich in sugar, not too rich in fat, you know, all those. You have to go to a dietitian who can help you with that. 
And if that doesn't work, then you need a, a feeding. You need a nasal jejunal feeding. And if for those who have really severe weight with a lot of pain, then a rescue uh, is needed with a total parental nutrition, which is the IV. And I suggest also for the pain, a celiac plexus block. If you could find someone who can do a celiac plexus block because it could help uh, if you can break the pain, it might help with the, with the rest of the symptoms. This is a problem. We need to find someone who can really do a good celiac plexus block. And then I'll talk about the procedures uh, as we go along. Uh, gastrojejunostomy, I don't recommend anymore because of the problems that they found long term. Uh, you can have uh, bile gastritis, you can have uh, mal malabsorption, you can have ulcers uh, created at the anastomosis. So uh, I don't recommend that. Uh, the so called strong procedure is um, dividing the ligonotrites. And uh, the problem is you can't measure how much you have divided. And, and I, I show you that I find that you can, you could have a, a kink at the dodino jejunal junction. It's persist. That's why if this is the only procedure you've done, um, the symptoms will recur. The old procedure was described in the, in the 60s by Dr. Um, Stavely. And this is the original duodeno jejunostomy, which is very complicated, and where you uh, rearrange where the duodenum is. However, the compression remains, you see? So I'm not sure how that works. I don't think anybody does that anymore. So now the duodenum jejunostomy being done is to just bypass the, uh, the area of obstruction uh, with or without division and regardless the obstruction remains or the compression remains so so i'm not sure long term how that's going to work now in uh, china they have done these complicated procedures almost like one you do for pancreas where they do a circular drainage i i don't recommend that you can see the obstruction or the compression of the duodenum persists even with that and then they made a complication, very complicated procedure with ruin Y and this and that. I, I'm not sure how that's gonna work. So regardless uh, with this, when there's a, when you bypass, you still have the compression with the pain, which can delay the gastric emptying and, and can go, uh, and dumping can, can occur. Other procedure described are so-called anterior transposition and then Dr. Ang right now used the, the so-called medial rotation of duodenum with duodenum that duodenosomy. I'll describe that later. And then the uh, inferior transposition of the superior medicine artery, which means that they divide the artery and then transpose it below the duodenum. This is done in Germany. I will describe that later. The um, Anterior transposition is done in Nigeria by Dr. Uh, Duvi, I think his name, and where he divide the duodenum and then transport, transport it over the artery. Uh, it's rather complicated. Uh, I don't think we have a long-term follow-up on that and the complications afterwards. I don't recommend that. This was uh, done in Japan in one case. This was described in 2007. And um, again, we don't have a long-term follow-up on that case. Now, Dr. Ang in uh, Ocala, he, uh, he and his resident were doing one of these cases. And then they did actually what, what I prescribed, which is uh, release all the adhesions. And, and then what they did was at the, uh, at the kink, they just put a staple uh, which is fine, which is what they're doing now. So actually, uh, so they created the straight, the duodenum jejunal junction is now straight down. So um, I talked to him uh, and I told him, make sure that you fix this. 
This has to be fixed uh, to the abdominal wall to prevent it from kinking and going back to where, where it came from. So this is actually a procedure that's pretty good if they, if they follow all the things that I have done. And this is one in Germany. Again, we need a long-term follow-up for that. And other therapies, I won't go to it other than if you have a biliary dysfunction, a gallbladder has to be removed. And when you have the nutcracker syndrome that's severe, then you do all kinds of other procedures, which we're not going to talk about today. Now, I'd come across a procedure uh, done in Singapore. And again, one patient, this doctor, uh, Wong Jensen, uh, does uh, pancreatic surgery. So he came across this patient that I communicated with me. I haven't heard from her for several months. The procedure was done, uh, I think it was uh, early January, where he re removed uh, part of the duodenum and then uh, connected it to the side of the above, the duodenum above it, and then he, he anastomosed it. So again, uh, this patient uh, still has mild symptoms, but no pain. She has no pain. So I'm going to go back and find out how she's doing. So actually, this uh, procedure could be a future option. Uh, I At first, I didn't understand it. But then when I start thinking about it, uh, it, it's a potential for a future procedure, but it can be done less complicated. I have some ideas how to do this less complicated, but I have to I have to follow that patient. I communicated with Doctor Wong, but he he didn't communicate with me, so I don't know what's happening. He would not he would answer he would not answer my email. So in 1989 we. Uh, first uh, describe the cases that we saw um, in a journal and then in then we updated it in 2009 and I call this duodenal durotation uh, experience we have uh, 37 patients all of them have pain some nausea vomiting in 12 of course they have early satiety and they have some, not everyone had weight loss. And one patient had prior uh, strong procedure and one patient had prior duodenal jejunostomy, which I undid, you know, we undid that and then they did the procedure. Here's uh, what I did before. I didn't do laparoscopy at that time, but I did, a, I made a very small incision. You don't need a big incision for, for this procedure. I've done it through a very small two, three inches incision. And you mobilize the colon all the way and then go underneath it, bring all the colon out to the belly with that small incision and you uh, start removing or uh, dividing the ligament of trites. And I, and you follow the principle of the, we call LADS procedure in pediatric surgery for the when we do uh, patients with abnormal rotation of the bowel. I just do reverse land. We call this a reverse land. So after you're done, you can, you, after you mobilize, you can see the duodenum right here, right here. And there's superior mesenteric vessels here. And uh, after you're done, the duodenum should be out of the superior mesenteric artery, you take it out. So you can see you relieve any obstruction of the, the renal vein as well in the process. Uh, here's the patient, there's still a kink here. And the objective is that uh, there won't be any kink. You can see here, this is where the duodenal jejunal junction, colon is here, colon, Here's the duodenal du jun junction. What's important is this has to be fixed to the abdominal wall. And then you also fix the colon to itself. Uh, this is something that 
it's missing to most surgeons, I think. I have to, I have to tell them how to do that. And, um, the very important fixation. And here uh, is a kink. And here's duodenum, here's dejunum. And this is for all where Dr. Ang puts a staple on here, which is fine. I, a staple is easy. I can, I can also do the same thing he's doing, but I've done it with, uh, by opening it, uh, actually doing a side-to-side -side anastomosis because it's right there. This is duodenum, this is jejunum. And just, I stitched, I stitched the wall, the back wall, like that. And then I open it. I opened the uh, duodenum jejunum. And this is a duodenum jejunostomy, what we call a physiologic anastomosis, unlike, unlike bypass. When you bypass, you don't do this. This one is direct into the, from duodenum to jejunum. And this is what I do. Yeah. And when it's completed right there. Then you fix that. And what happens is, here's the x-ray. It's showing the, where the small bowel is. And then uh, a delayed x-ray showing the colon will be on the other side. The small bowel will be on the right side. So um, all these patients seem to be doing well. I, I have, uh, I have, uh, follow them except for one patient who has remained to have uh, gastroparesis, although she says she's, she's feeling better. I don't know. I'm not sure. She also has some issues. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I do an antrotomy, which is different from uh, pyloroplasty by just splitting the muscles proximal to the pylorus. And that's for people with delayed gastric emptying. And then she, I need to teach people that, how to do that properly. Here's the collage of all the patients that I've done from Canada to uh, from different states of the union. Uh, when you have gastroparesis, uh, problem is uh, very difficult. However, uh, one of my patients uh, who is now 21, they're taking Domperidone. Domperidone is a drug that's not approved yet by the FDA, but you can get this in Canada. And if you go to a research center, you can get Domperidone. It seemed to help with uh, motility. They tried the Pacer, uh, Botox injection, but it only lasts for sometimes short time. Like uh, I have, they have one patient that uh, they tried Botox who was 16 years old in Ohio. It didn't last long. Then you do a uh, pyloroplasty, it's bad. When you do what pyloroplasty, when you actually cut the pylorus, you can't reverse that. Once you do that, it, uh, the patient can have dumping syndrome forever. So I, I suggest antrotomy. It's different from pyloroplasty, very different. Uh, gastric pacer, I, I have not seen it to be effective. Median arcuate ligament, if it's present, uh, has to be ruled out. And what happens is that you have a, a ligament, the tight ligament from the um, diaphragm causing the narrowing. And you can diagnose it by using a Doppler ultrasound. And also you can do an MRI or a CT scan showing the narrowing. And uh, once you, you can release that laparoscopically or open in conjunction with the SMA. And when it's finished, uh, you can see that the narrowing has been relieved. So what do we really need now for the SMA? We need a, a team. You can't just have one person, you need a team. Of course, you need a surgeon who might do the surgery, but you also need uh, a dedicated uh, gastroenterologist with a nutritionist, and then you need a pain uh, management uh, specialist. 
You also need a psychologist or psychiatrist, a social worker, and clergy. You need a, a whole team, much like you do for transplant. So if you happen to get into a transplant program that already has this team, hopefully that might be the place to be. So if you can find a center that has a team of some sort for certain conditions, and you have a dedicated person who, who would learn about the syndrome and can treat it both medically or surgically, that, that's the key. Of course, we have our SMA syndrome awareness area. We know that already. And you know about your awareness days. And now you have uh, NORD, which is the uh, National Organization of Rare Diseases. And uh, they made me the editor for the SMA syndrome. And you can see, you can read that. I think if you read that article that I wrote in that NORD, it give you a lot of ideas, give you many things that you might consider. Uh, what I told you today uh, is, is somewhat described in that article that I wrote for NORD. So conclusion, um, this is a true, this is entity. I think uh, the, the incidents that uh, they describe in the literature has never been challenged. It needs to be challenged. The 3D CT is the gold standard for diagnostic modality. MRI, if the patient is allergic to, uh, to the dye, to the contrast. Conservative management should be attempted, but uh, if, they, if there's a congenital predisposition, uh, maybe a surgical approach is needed right away, sooner than later. Uh, I believe that some of the patients that may have uh, lost weight, see, the thing about weight loss is that patients who had gastric bypass for uh, morbid obesity, they don't develop SMA. Uh, only maybe one or two cases I saw in the literature that had SMA. Maybe they had a prior predisposition. So this has to be uh, addressed. And uh, for young child who, if they develop SMA early on, um, like four years of age, I've seen that, and uh, maybe they have congenital predisposition. So I, I re recommend duodenal durotation but with fixation of the DG junction and cecum is the procedure of choice. We only use the duodenal dejunostomy direct, that the physiologic one, not the, not the bypass. If there's a kink and angulation at the DG junction after you do the derotation. And if the delayed gastric emptying, then they should perform an antrotomy. And if there is a, a major acute ligand syndrome, then uh, you should also correct that problem at the same time. If there's a gallbladder problem, you remove the gallbladder. So this is what we need, is a team approach. Then they need to do more research on the role of mesenteric fat because the, the papers I've seen so far are not conclusive. You need to research more on the cause of intractable pain. And I think the we need to hopefully some somebody will come up with the celiac plexus block as a part of the treatment so that you can break the pain. And maybe the, if there's a transient ischemia, it might be relieved by the, by the block. And then we do more research on the psychogenic aspect of the disease, which came first. Uh, is it really because everybody thought everybody was crazy or is it because they had the pain and hopelessness that caused them the, to be, uh, have some psychological problem. We need to determine the, the true incidence and we need to know the timing for surgical intervention. And then of course we need to have a uh, study for long-term results for any procedure. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah. Okay.
So I have some questions now. Um, so let's uh, clear the slides now. Or do you want me to just stop without me being seen? Um, let me see. <laughs> okay, doesn't matter. Okay, there we go. Okay, there you go. So okay. the first question that was sent to us was, I'm a newly diagnosed 40-year-old. Wait. Wait. Got to unmute Dr. Kim. Dr. Kim. Dr. Okay. Kim. Again. Hi, Dr. Kim. How are you? He's still muted. Oh, so muted. You're muted. He can unmute himself, I think. I did. There okay. you go. You are. How are Hi, you? Dr. Olivier. How are you? Good. Did you like my presentation? Absolutely. Wonderful. Learned a lot from you. Yeah. Well, this is what, I mean, I've been... I've been uh, doing this for 40 years, so I, I, uh, I've I, seen different aspects of it, and not everyone is the same. That's why you have to, I always say, individualize each patient, and then you assess them uh, based upon what they what they show and how they respond to, the, to your treatment. Right, I agree. I think, I think Dr. Kim lives in that realm. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. All so, right. Go ahead. Tara. All right. I am a newly diagnosed 40 year old female. Her CTA aortic mesenteric angle is 17 and the distance is six to seven millimeters. Mm -hmm. She did a trial of TPN for five months and gained 20 pounds. They repeated the CTA seven months later and it showed no change in angle or distance. Right. Her Upper GI series did not help with the diagnosis as she has intermittent obstruction along with mesenteric aspect of the third portion of the duodenum. The medical community here is confused due to lack of a total obstruction, and she was informed that this blockage is slower than usual. What does this mean? Well, the, the CT scan already showed that, that they have a abnormal angle. And also the distance is uh, impressive, you know. So I don't think, uh, and also, like I mentioned, uh, the obstruction is intermittent. It's not a, it's not like every every time, every day, every minute. No, it's intermittent. And so you have to correlate with her symptoms. You see, she's having a lot of pain. The, the key is the pain. If if they have if they have pain, they can eat. They don't want to eat. Right? If they don't, if they have pain, they don't want to eat. They don't want to do anything. She so. also asked, would you recommend surgery? And if so, how d would she know what is happening with the ligament of trites? Well, you won't know that until you go into surgery, until you divide it and uh, release it, and you have to do uh, the, ro the rotation. So uh, you got to find. I think Dr. Ang's procedure, I think he's doing the rotation somehow. And then he does the, he, he, he always staples everyone. I mean, he, he all, because that's what they discovered that they were doing. But I don't think you need to, uh, to staple it or suture it, do, uh, do the duodenal jejunostomy if you can relieve the obstruction with the, the rotation. And then, but then you need to fix the, uh, that area to the abdominal wall to prevent it from kinking or to go back to where it was. And then her last question was, she needs to have a hysterectomy. Is SMA syndrome a reason to not have this procedure? <laughs> hysterectomy? Well, if the hysterectomy is vital and she's still sur surviving and she's, she can eat, she's not losing a lot of weight and, and she can... Uh, um, you know, you, you, you don't need to have an operation with, with this SMA. I have, I have a doctor who was actually my co-author, Dr. Chi Ha. He, he thinks he has, he has SMA syndrome, but he never had an operation. He, he, he remains really skinny and lean, a stanic built, and he knows how much he can eat, and he knows when to stop whatever he's doing and relieve himself. So my co-author, Dr. Chi Ha, who's who's uh, from from Vietnam originally, uh, is a plastic surgeon in um, in California, and he's doing well without surgery. 
Dr. Kim, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I don't do SMA surgery uh, myself, although I uh, help to manage uh, them. Um, just uh, for th those who are joining uh, that uh, don't, don't know my background a little bit, um, I'm a vascular surgeon by training uh, and uh, sort of uh, got into compression syndromes and uh, help patients manage uh, all four compressions, uh, SMAS, MALS, Nutcracker, and May Thunder syndrome, which all four are in my, in my uh, office, uh, and I'm sure Dr. Uh, uh, Alvarez uh, would agree. It's actually pretty commonly seen um, for me. Um, and so, uh, but in terms of uh, addressing the hysterectomy part of it, I, if there's a true indication for hysterectomy, um, I, I don't see why uh, SMA surgery should interfere or hysterectomy should interfere with uh, uh, each surgery other than uh, adhesions, which can happen with hysterectomy to small bowel. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but it's good to uh, uh, make sure the, the hysterectomy has a true indication. Uh, as in my field, uh, uh, patients get pelvic venous congestion and get hysterectomy, uh, which uh, oftentimes with uh, venous uh, compression issues, uh, can be dealt with without uh, needing a hysterectomy at early age or, or even at late age. Um, so I think it's good to find out. Uh, in general, I think hysterectomy is being done uh, a bit uh, overdone uh, because there's not enough understanding about pelvic congestion uh, uh, syndrome uh, and, and uh, venous cause of the pelvic conditions. Uh, but uh, that, that would be my thought. Okay. Um from, from what I've found in my research, uh, just kind of looking around, if a person has nutcracker syndrome, more than likely they have pelvic congestion syndrome. And for those patients, if the nutcracker is not addressed and they have a hysterectomy, they're still going to have, you know, collateral veins and everything like that. So, um, True. Just uh, just to chime in, there's two different causes for pelvic congestion mm -hmm. as a venous uh, or vascular cause. Uh, one is the nutcracker syndrome, and the other more common uh, is May Thurner syndrome. Uh, yeah. Just like SMA syndrome, Dr. Alvarez. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, May Thurner syndrome is, is uh, not common, uh, not uncommon at all. Uh, uh, yeah, very uncommon. General population. Yeah. Um, you know, it's uh, it's thought to be very very uncommon only in young females. But I've treated uh, uh, from males to ages 80 uh, on these patients with wow. a May Thurner syndrome. Uh, and so male and female, uh, certainly more female. But so I think uh, May Thurner syndrome uh, certainly is a, a more often cause of the pelvic congestion for venous uh, congestion. And then nutcracker comes uh, right. as a second to that. Uh, all right, the next question is, at what point of urgency should a patient have SMAS surgery? Since SMAS is considered life-threatening, would weight loss be a significant reason to have the procedure? My daughter is 16 years, five foot four, and has drastically dropped to 70 pounds. Mm. Well, again, I said, uh, the first thing is, uh, uh, rescue, uh, where you do a, if you really have lost a lot of weight and you're weak, you can hardly walk and you're in a wheelchair, then you need to have uh, a rescue with uh, TPN and they should do general feeding or both at the same time. You gotta, you gotta feed them because if you operate in someone who is really extremely minorities, your, your chances of success is gonna be, it's gonna be a failure. So you need to rescue them first. And then, uh, even if, so after you rescue them and they gain some weight or uh, you stabilize their weight and they, even if they don't gain weight and they gain strength, then you, you determine based upon your studies whether they're suitable for surgery of any kind. Because if you do surgery in someone who, who is in bad shape, because, uh, this is not an, uh, an emergent type surgery. This is an elective. Uh, so you you don't rush them to the OR just because they have one and they're not ready for it. So 
I can tell you one case where we had uh, another situation. Uh, well, I was in the mission in uh, Honduras and they showed me this skin and bones kid. I said, no way. Even if I'm the greatest surgeon in the world, I'm going to kill her. So we brought this kid to the States. We fed her until she gained 60, 60 pounds and I was able to do the procedure that I needed to do. So that's what I mean. It's not, even after you re rescue them and they, you stabilize their weight or they stay the same and they gain their strength back and the electrolyte studies are back to normal, everything normal. Then, then you can assess whether they can, they, they can uh, uh, benefit from surgery at that time. Okay. In the literature, SMAS is often referred to as a controversial diagnosis. As patients, we regularly feel the skepticism when we mention our condition to a specialist, even when we have a firm diagnosis with imaging to match. Why is SMAS still considered controversial? Is there, um, is there actual dissent in the medical community about the existence of the condition, like chronic fatigue in the 90s? Are there experts who believe that the compression that we see in imaging is just an incidental finding and that the condition is actually psychological or is it just a lack of understanding? I think this is more lack of understanding, I think. And, and with the, as Dr. Kim mentioned, there are a lot of syndromes uh, that are very rare and, and you need to understand them and how you're gonna individualize uh, the patient. And, uh, and this is a very difficult problem. And all I can tell you is that I've had the, all my patients so far are doing doing well after the procedure I've done, and including siblings, and now they're graduating, they're getting married, you know, all that, and they they still communicate with me up to now. So, I think this is syndrome is not as rare as most people would believe. We need to do that. Uh, we need to challenge the uh, prevalence of this, this condition all over the world because I've seen this. In a cruise ship, when I was when uh, when I went to Egypt, <laughs> somebody came and referred a patient to me. So it's not uncommon, and I've seen patients from the Philippines. I mean, I'd like to chime in, uh, chime in a little bit that you know uh, these what's considered rare disease uh i think really needs to be centralized or at least regionalized in yeah. terms of care that's the only way that or or uh, you know the foundation that i've uh, started for uh, abdominal vascular compression syndromes which includes smas you know you know worldwide network of in, uh, registry uh, where we uh, you know uh, update our, our patient care and results and outcomes Especially if it's rare, you know, when you see one or two cases a year uh, at most in a, in a single center, that doesn't help you to learn uh, uh, over time. Um, you know, instead, if you get 10 cases a year or 20, if it's centralized, then you get to learn about these uh, conditions much faster, which was the case for me when I was uh, uh, starting with May Thurner syndrome. I was able to see a lot of patients in a very short time. Uh, uh, and that was uh, that was very helpful uh, as a clinician uh, to put together that May Thurner syndrome uh, is about leg swelling too, but sometimes it's more than that. That includes pelvic congestion and urinary symptoms and cardiac symptoms and uh, GI symptoms as well. And so um, I think it needs to be centralized a little bit better, but there's you know, certainly uh, not enough interest um, uh, to go around for, for uh, these syndromes. Um, yeah, I agree with you because the problem is that when a surgeon attempts to do it and then it fails or it was successful and then he doesn't want to be called. I mean, once the patient leaves the office and the patient has problems, then he doesn't want to deal with it anymore. And, 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 and the thing is that now with everybody being employed, uh, a lot of people employed, uh, 
you can concentrate on one disease because you need to have a like I said a team and a center that were are willing to put their um because I tried my uh my previous uh you know hospital and and they won't they won't take them I mean they they seen I, they seen the patient's problem and and what can happen to them afterwards and how long it takes to for them to recover because the surgery itself is not a it's not like a it's not like a miracle surgery. It takes time for them to recover. Uh, the the problem with the gas, delayed gastric emptying can improve with with time, but if you expect it to get better, all right, after surgery, you you you're wrong. It doesn't work that way. They get to wait. They have to to wait for the symptoms to clear up. They have to be patient. They have to understand that the surgery that you do might not and that give you an instant cure. You have to be patient. And because I've seen that during, now that people are following, I'm following me in Facebook and everything, that all the patients are doing well and happy. And But it took time. Some of them are really crazy. <laughs> Some of them were <laughs> in drugs. Uh, uh, the best patient I have is an Amish patient who never had any drugs whatsoever. And, and I did the procedure and she went home five days later, never had any symptoms afterwards. So, so it depends on the patient and what they've been doing before that. The one crazy patient we have is still having problems. <laughs> so. We shouldn't talk about people being crazy, Dr. Alley. We don't talk about it or no. Sorry. <laughs> You're a whole group of people. <laughs> no, we're no, all but, crazy. But, but yeah. I'm crazy. I'm crazy too. But because I, I, I believe in the syndrome. <laughs> Put your hand down. You're still practicing. He's he's retired. He can say that. <laughs> no, I'm uh, I'm not afraid to say that. I, I, you know, people could call me crazy, and and I take that as a badge of honor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. But crazy, we're all crazy in a good way, but you know, Absolutely. we all want, we all want, you know, we want to be fixed immediately. And, and I, I think Dr. Alviar wants people to understand that, yeah, you have the surgery, but it does take time. And I just sent him a study. I don't know if I sent it to you or not, Dr. Kim. And it was this study where um, the doctors did a gastric emptying study after surgery and then i think it was a year later they did a gastric emptying study and then two years later they did a gastric emptying study just and the and the the idea behind it was you should do a gastric emptying study imme like immediately after the patient has surgery and then yearly to to show the patient that they're getting better and it's how you prove to the patient that they're improving because it takes time for the stomach to get better because right. that's the part of that's the part of the surgery that takes the longest to improve is not so much you know the surgery fixes the situation but the stomach and the duodenum take time to get back to their best spike Right. Um, th their best, whatever you want to say, their best where where they are, where they can be. It doesn't take a day. It takes months and years. When you see somebody who's got a stomach that's stretched out the size of a watermelon, or you know, two watermelons, how long does that take to to get back to normal? Maybe it never does. But you know, if you if you don't have some sort of you know, way to way to show a starting point and progression. You you can't prove anything, so that's why they 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 were showing. Let's do a gastric emptying study and sh and prove that this person really didn't have gastroparesis. It was getting better. Anyway, sorry. Next question. The question that has been brewing as I work on evaluation of all compressions is if a patient has global dysmotility throughout, esophagus, stomach, 
small intestine. What are some thoughts regarding an open abdominal surgery for compressions when surgery may help huge progression in dysmotility? Would this be one of those instances of utilizing the scary stent approach, aka internal stent for nutcracker syndrome? That might be for you, Dr. Kim. I didn't, yeah, I, I would like to answer that, but I didn't get the question very clearly. I think uh, there's several prongs to this question. Uh, first, you know, if a uh, patient had a, a slow gastric emptying or dysmotility throughout their uh, small bowel, uh, from esophagus uh, uh, down to the small bowel or even large bowel, you know, that has to be uh, distinguished clearly from whether it's uh, truly an SMAS uh, uh, issues or is it uh, general dysmotility issues of Sherry, various causes. Um, you want to unmute and ask? She, she's very wordy. She's already had SMAS surgery and I think she has nutcrackers. So she wants to know, you know, instead of having like a big nutcracker, surgery should she just have a oh, stent? I see. Um, you know, endovascular stenting uh, has uh, evolved a lot over the last two years for venous stenting. Um, and mm -hmm. the, the endovascular stenting, the, the most reliable one that I, I see is one out of Pittsburgh of 19 patients. There are papers uh, out of other places that include 70 patients, but then uh, some of those, a lot of those uh, large number of cases have a lot of complications and um, male to female ratio is actually more male than female. So hard to extrapolate those studies. One, one out of Pittsburgh actually is most recent uh, in 2019 uh, where they really had no migration and about 70% success rate. Um, now with, with those patients uh, who get endovascular stenting, uh, several things needs to be considered, I think. Um, First, uh, you know, it's very important to rule out any metal allergies because these are uh, metal uh, uh, titanium or other metal uh, alloys with a bunch of different uh, metal components. And oftentimes with people with multiple compressions have, uh, as Dr. Alvira has mentioned, uh, has Ehlers-Danlos and subgroup of those Ehlers-Danlos patients have MCAS, uh, uh, mast cell activation syndrome or mastocytosis. And those group of patients tend to have uh, uh, a lot of allergies to, uh, or reactions or, or different reactions to medications or, or, or materials. And so extremely important uh, in this group uh, of patients to rule that out first. Um, and then, um, and I think that's a, that's a great option, minimally invasive small needle stick procedure. Um, success rates on, on based on their study of 19 patients, about 70%, which is uh, a good number, unfortunately, um, for uh, nutcracker syndrome uh, compared to open surgeries, uh, I, I feel that are, those are pre-equivalent. And so with abdominal surgeries in the past, I think endovascular stenting is an option, but uh, tread carefully uh, uh, prior to deciding on that and then pick the right surgeon to do it to us. Uh, right. who's been doing this for uh, some time. Um, uh, certainly, uh, I think I, I completely agree with Dr. Alvarez uh, that, you know, these uh, surgeries are not, not quick cures like appendectomies. Um, you know, it takes time, you know, sometimes up to six months uh, or more uh, time to really have the result. And so, um, but, but I think that's a good option uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Okay. I have conflicting opinions from several doctors on whether I have NCS and SMAS or neither. Does it seem sensible in that case to pursue a PTFE sheath stent since it could potentially help with both? Do you have opinions about specific surgical techniques for these or about the length and diameter um, I've heard Abaza uses longer stent than Kadedu and Salmon uses a wider one. I only know of these three surgeons who use them for Nutcracker Syndrome, SMAS. And then they go on to say, most patients seem to have increased back pain after these are placed. 
Most seem to go away, but others do not. Any idea why or how to prevent it? I heard it's because the pancreas is displaced in the surgery and gets irritated. Well, I don't know, Dr. Kim, can you answer that question? That's very yeah, I, uh, I have some, some thoughts on that. Um, you know, the extravascular stent uh, really evolved back in 19, uh, 1980s, uh, 1985 for Nutcracker syndrome. Um, and, um, you know, it is to undo the uh, compression by the SMA. However, it doesn't undo the uh, uh, high riding aorta due to spine because of whether it's a scoliosis or lordosis. Uh, and so uh, that's where I think uh, extravascular stents for nutcracker syndrome have some failure rates um, as well. Um, the pain related to uh, the post-surgery, uh, um, you know, I don't know. Um, I, I think uh, there could be a lot of different issues related to it. Um, uh, as you could imagine, there's a, you know, superior mesenteric uh, ganglions, which are another two ganglions that sits just above the superior mesenteric artery. And when you enlarge that angle way too much, maybe those nerves are irritated. Um, it could be the the uh, the strength of the PTFE graft that is pressing down toward the spine, although it's just sitting on top of the aorta. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I do hear about people complaining about back pain uh, with this. Um, the pain source can be so many different things uh, here that it's, it's very difficult to uh, decipher where it is really coming from. Um, but uh, in my mind, uh, the, for patients who truly have Nutcracker syndrome and SMAS, and the symptoms are different uh, for those two. Um, for the sake of uh, our conversation with Dr. Arloez, Alvir, um, you know, I'll, I'm not going to those, but those are, uh, there's some difference in their symptoms. And so I think it's good to definitely uh, evaluate them first uh, separately. And then uh, if uh, two are coexisting, coexisting, which I've seen fairly fair amount, because uh, it's the same pathology in terms of aeromesenteric angle. Um, uh, and, uh, and as Dr. Alvir mentioned, uh, there's many patients with a very uh, compressed uh, the renal vein who's doing perfectly fine. Uh, and so it really needs to take into account that that's really creating the problem. Um, then the extravascular stent for combined symptoms uh, syndrome, I think it's reasonable first approach uh, uh, because I've seen, you know, again, this is uh, certain, certainly not uh, well understood or published, but I've seen, uh, you know, fair number of people who really improve their SMAS like symptoms. Uh, maybe those are the ones who truly did not have SMAS uh, that I don't know, uh, but um, certainly SMAS-like symptoms uh, with uh, anatomic criteria that will fit uh, both uh, Nutcracker and SMAS. Um, uh, I mean, I think this is where I, uh, Dr. Alvir, I mean, I have lots of uh, uh, questions for you uh, uh, because as a vascular surgeon and, and you being a pediatric uh, surgeon, you know, there, uh, our experiences are, are a bit different and that's how we get to learn um, uh, about uh, different things. Uh, you know, something that I struggle with, Dr. Alvier, uh, is, you know, patients, uh, uh, nutcracker patients almost always have compression of the duodenum, mm -hmm. um, And so, uh, because of that angle. So, but not all of them have SMAS, uh, in fact, uh, very, not, and I would say minority of them really have true SMAS. And so uh, getting to a diagnosis of, you know, SMAS becomes uh, uh, kind of critical, whether that needs to be treated at, at the same time or treated separately at another time. Um, how much of emphasis do you put on, other than the CT scan, which I, I completely agree with you, how much emphasis uh, do you put on upper GI or gastric emptying or, or those studies? And what are the specific things that do you look for and say, okay, big, that's definitely a, a obstructive uh, symptoms based on SMAS. And then second question would be, uh, maybe you can help me to understand 
why would SMAS symptoms be intermittent? Regular roles now, I guess. Right. Well, these are the, the things that need to be addressed. I mean, right. we don't know. I have no idea because, uh, like I said, it's chicken and egg as far as the psychogenic symptoms, the same thing. Why Why would they feel that way? Is it because they're desperate and nobody understand them and their symptoms? This is why you need to have uh, other steps like... Uh, a celiac plexus block, for example, might be an interesting uh, step, you know. Right. Because once you relieve the pain, as you can see, when somebody has a lot of pain, the pain can get worse. Just like the chronic pain syndrome patient, if you, that's why people now are doing blocks before they do surgery. I always did it, like for the kids, when I, before I make my incision, I block the kids. I block. I either give them a local before my incision or I give them a caudal block or whatever block if I'm doing the lower incision. So those kids can jump around right after surgery, like there's no pain. See, we need we need to figure out how you can how you can interrupt the pain pathway. I think all your patients that had figure out a way how you can uh, interrupt their pain and see if they get relieved. That's very important, extremely important for research. Right, right, agree. Extremely important. And and patient, I said you, I have one patient who had the nutcracker syndrome and SMA, and I did the duodenal derotation, and she's doing perfectly well now. She's married, and I'm waiting for the first baby. That's a great right. news. Right. So I hope to to be in the christening for that baby one day. When they have the, their baby, they had been married two years, so okay. it's it's time for them to have the baby. If they have the baby and they invite me, uh, I'll be very ecstatic. Right. Okay. So we need to do a lot of research for everything you said. Absolutely, no question. And we need a dedication. You need to have a team. You have to make sure that they know all all these things. I all the things I mentioned in my uh, conclusion very important. That that we follow that through, yeah. And maybe you're the guy who can follow it through and uh, and find find the answers, uh, especially with the pain, the cause of the pain. Very important. Uh, uh, I think we can study ischemia because, as you know, uh, when you have uh, you can step on a you can step on a small bowel, you can step on a colon, and you won't have pain. But if you stretch it. And you uh, you lose blood supply in the within the bowel itself, and you 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 decrease the inner uh, uh, vessel, the capillaries. That's when you have the pain. It's from ischemia. I always tell my students, "What's the worst thing? What's the worst thing you can have?" They always say, "Oh, kidney stone." But but if you have ischemia, that's why when you have a clot that goes into your leg. Uh, you have severe pain from that when you have a clot in your heart. When you have a, a thrombosis in, in part of you, you have severe pain, ischemia. So there must be some kind of ischemia involved in the pain. I could, I could definitely see that. Um... Yeah, so we need to, re to do more research and, and prove it. Right. Yeah. Can I ask you a question, Dr. Kim? What? What, so, what would you, why do you consider somebody that would have compression on their duodenum not having SMAS? What, why did you ask Dr. Alviar that question? So if they have, Because, sorry. you know, when you see duodenal compression uh, right. on CT scan, uh, just like uh, uh, left renal vein compression on CT scan, these are more anatomic findings. Right. They're not necessarily a physiologic findings, okay. right? So, you know, people can have compressions based on uh, imagings, but that doesn't mean that they have the syndrome. Right. So it's As, not somebody who's complaining of the eating, no, you pain have with correlate. eating and all yeah. that stuff. Have some yeah, okay. you definitely. The symptoms definitely have to correlate with it. Okay. The difficult part, uh, as, as Dr. Alvear mentioned, that median arcuate ligament syndrome, neurogenic uh, mals, Nutcracker syndrome that affects the upper GI system and SMAS, they have somewhat similar, uh, you know, similar uh, complaints, right. you know, uh, early satiety, uh, uh, epigastric pain, nausea, vomiting, 
um, and that they, you know, nutcracker patients, some portion of those of those patients have uh, delayed gastric emptying um, uh, and stuff. And so the, the complexity of dealing with uh, people, especially when they present with multiple compressions, uh, is uh, the level of complexity is there. Uh, at, but uh, I find each one of them have shared uh, uh, symptoms, but then sort of independent sy symptoms as well that uh, makes it a little bit uh, uh, helpful to uh, make those diagnoses a little bit clearer. But anatomic position of compression seen on uh, just on imaging uh, alone is just not enough uh, right. in my mind. Um, and I, I think Dr. Alvira would agree uh, as well as he, he alluded to already. Um, but that's why I was asking, uh, you know, other than the compression on CT scan, you know, let's say, you know, what are other things uh, from upper GI or gastric emptying or different studies that do you look to see to confirm those things uh, along if they have all the symptoms? Or is it right. CT scan uh, yeah. all, all you really need, Dr. Well, the upper GI, The upper GI can be important. At right. the time of the symptom, you know, when the patient is having severe symptom, not uh -huh. the next day, because if you if you do it the next day, because the right. problem is you can't schedule it right away. I mean, when you you know how it is how to schedule right. it, right? Then they you could be a week before they can do the study, and right. then by then the patient have no symptoms. Right. Would you recommend then uh, people when they visit ER uh, with a suspected uh, SMAS to have? Right. Uh, oral and IV contrast. Yes, correct. At the same time? Should have both. Yeah. Okay, that yeah. that makes sense to it's me. Extremely well. important to have both. Yeah. And you can have, you, as you shown you on my uh, CT scan, they have both. Uh, they, you can see the dilated stomach. You right. can see compression. You can right. do all that. You can do IV and and oral contrast. Yeah, very right. important to have both. Thank okay. you for your answer. Appreciate it. Thank you. Are we done, Stacy? We are done, yes. Do Time it. to, thanks for everybody's questions. Sorry we didn't okay. get to everybody, but we, we'll do this again. Yeah, Dr. Kim, we need to chat Dr. more. Kim. I Dr. know. Dr. Dr. Alvir, I would, uh, I would love to chat with you more. Um, and maybe uh, you yes. would come to Honduras with me in October. <laughs> He's got a lot going on too. I need a, I need a vascular surgeon. Uh, uh, we'll chat. I definitely uh, would love to uh, uh, chat with yeah, you. Email and, me. Yeah. We'll email do. me and then we can uh, communicate more and we can talk about, I can lead you to what kind of research you might not want to do because I'm retired. So <laughs> I need someone to do research on everything that I pointed out. And then I think I you... sent, I think I sent Dr. Kim your yeah. phone number. Good. But if not, I will. Yeah. We'll give you a call, Dr. Uh, okay. Alvier. Thanks for Wonderful. inviting me to Thank you talk. so much. Appreciate yeah, this was so good. Much. Was very good. Thank you, everyone. For everyone. Thank Thanks you. for coming. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much.